Uh, my name is Scott Ambler, and this is Mark Lines. Mark Lines. So we're going to um, our presentation today is about how do you create high-performing organizations. So if you happen to have been to my presentation yesterday, that was about high-performing teams. Uh, so now we're looking at the we're going to discuss the organization um, aspect of this, and we're uh, we're working through a theme of the uh, an old Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So I hope you're some of you are familiar with it at least. Um, it, it's uh, more of an old guy thing. Um, but anyway, so who are we? So we're the, uh, the creators of the, the, the Discipline Agile Toolkit. Um, and one of the things that we do is we work around the world to help enterprise class organizations to adopt and to transform themselves and to adopt these Agile and Lean strategies and to become more effective. And that's basically what we do. And we're going to share our experiences doing that today. So I'm going to ask you to think outside the box. Some of the, some of the ideas are a bit radical. Um, one of the uh, one of the messages here today is that there is no official recipe. Um, every organization is different. Everybody's journey is different. So if you're looking for, a, a, you know, the easy 10-step process or the, the Cotter 8-step method or, you know, you know whatever you know, multi-step method you want, um, there is no multi-step method. So um, you, you really do need to do the work and go on a journey, uh, not just a transformation project. So uh, that's one of the things we'll, we'll talk about. So we're going to work through uh, in slightly different order than the movie. Uh, we're going to start with the ugly and the bad, and then uh, Mark, will, uh, Mark will get into the good stuff, and then we'll ra wrap it up, and we'll take questions uh, towards the end, of course. So the ugly. So what are, the, what are some of the challenges that we're seeing with Agile transformations? Uh, the first one is that these change efforts in general, it's not just an Agile thing, uh, in general, the, these change efforts have a, have a reasonably poor uh, track record. Uh, you know, as we're seeing, roughly one-third of these change management efforts are succeeding. And there, there's many reasons for this. A lot of it is the people leading the transformations, the ones that are doing, that are you know, leading these journeys, often don't have a background in, in this organizational change management stuff. Um, so they're, you know, in some ways, they're making it up as they go. So we're, um, what we want to do today is share, some, share our strategies for doing this. And you know, I think it's important to point out, we, you know, like I said earlier, we do this on a regular basis. This is you know, what our organization does. Um, yes, we, you know, we share the, the, the Discipline Agile Toolkit with the world, but you know, our bread and butter is to help organizations actually do this stuff in practice. So some of the challenges that we see in the, in the world are some reasonably unrealistic expectations. This is a, um, Jeff Sutherland's latest book. And this is a great book. You know, no, please don't uh, get me wrong. This is, a, this is a wonderful book, and I suggest reading it. Um, but look at this promise here. We're, we're promised you know, uh, four times productivity improvement. This is the implication of this, of this title. And, and sure enough, some teams do in fact see this. And you know, I, I've worked with some very dysfunctional teams and some reasonably dysfunctional organizations. And you know, there's a possibility to actually get some you know, radical improvement like this. But what we're actually seeing, uh, and I want to point out, this, is, this data is not from us. This is from a gentleman by, by the name of Don Reifer. And he did his PhD in this topic of basically how effective is Agile, how, how well are organizations doing this Agile stuff. And now he runs a business. Um, he, con he continues to study. He continues to research. So he's constantly updating his data. He's constantly um, sharing his results. He's you know, selling his results. That's how he's making his money, I, I imagine. And um, what he's finding is that we're not seeing this awesome productivity improvements. We are seeing some, which is good. But we're not seeing as much as we'd like. And certainly at scale, we're seeing even worse. So we need to, you know, part of our message here is we need to be realistic. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing you know, not what we were hoping for is because people, and, you know, particularly senior management, is looking for easy answers. They're looking for, they just tell me what to do. I want to I, I transform my organization this year or this quarter to become agile and then move on. And there isn't an answer like that. This is a, a continuous journey of many, many years. We need to become a learning organization um, and, and strive to get better at all points in time. So um, we need to be realistic. We also need to understand everybody needs to change. It's not just about the workers. It's not just about the teams. It's about the entire organization. And if there's one common theme that I've heard, at least in the two in the, in the two morning keynotes so far at the conference, is that it's really an organizational thing, and everybody needs to evolve, not just, not just the people in the trenches. And it's really about culture change. 
And as we know, culture is uh, difficult. You know, you know uh, uh, this is an old quote, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, culture change is very difficult, and you can't force people to change. So if you sat in on the, the morning keynote um, and, and, the, and the, the talk that immediately followed, um, there, there was some very interesting things um, being said there. And one of it was you can't force people to do things. You have to, have to motivate them. They, they have to decide to change. So this is, uh, this is very interesting. So we've seen many organizations try to force a framework on people. They try to force, this is this new agile way of working, and just go and, go and do it. And that doesn't work. People have to accept. They have to, they have to be the ones to make the change themselves. They've got to decide to, to, to improve and to change the way that they're working, to change um, their way of thinking. Um, so they have to internalize it. Um, so change can be hard, but it can be a lot easier. Part of our message here today is it can be a lot easier if you understand what you're doing. And I think one of the reasons why we're only seeing a, a one-third success rate is because we have people that really don't understand how to do this change, and they're, you know, and, and they're, they're doing the best they can. But you know, there, are, there are a few techniques and a few ways of looking at things that are absolutely critical. And this is what we're, we're, we're going to focus on when we get into the good section that Mark is going to work through. So some of the bad things, some of the, the questionable strategies. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer in trade-offs and in understanding what works well and what doesn't work well. Um, this is, you know, for those of you who remember the patterns community and then the anti-patterns community. I was actually one of the people that believed in anti-patterns as well as patterns because I believe it's important to understand what works well, effective patterns, but it's also important to understand effective or ineffective anti-patterns that don't work well. What can we avoid? What are bad ideas that we really want to avoid if we can? So one of the things that we're seeing, um, which is good, is that Agile, the Agile community, is really good at building software development teams. We really are. We're at the leading edge of this, and particularly you know, the DevOps stuff when you're bringing in technical issues as well. We really are good at building these teams, these racing car engines. You know, and we're good at tuning them and tweaking them and getting better performance out of them and better, better quality out of them. We really are good at that. But then we take these Agile, these agile teams, these great racing car engines, and we plunk them into our organizational tractor, and we wonder why we're not winning the race. Well, we only end up with a tractor with a really cool engine. And that's, not, that's better than a tractor without a cool engine, but it really is, is going to get the job done. So if you want to win the race, if you want to you know, if you want to be a truly agile business, then you need a racing car. You need to actually look at the bigger picture. And, and this, I think, like I said, this has been a common theme um, throughout the conference so far, is that you know, we've got to look at the bigger picture and really be um, asking, how do we transform the entire organization? So to sort of you know, bring this back to one of the things that we're seeing um, from a DA point of view, that we see a lot of organizations, they focus on, you know, let's create agile, agile scrum teams or lean, lean Kanban teams you know, at the software development space. And then they really sort of ignore everything else. And they, they, they don't, do the, you know, they don't um, focus on how do, we, how do we bring Agile to finance, or to procurement, or to marketing, or to enterprise architecture, and, or to data management, or these, all these other important aspects of the organization. So we really need to look at this, at the overall picture. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit as well. So, and one of the things, so one of the challenges with this chart, and, and, and this chart is the, the, the big poster for, for the Discipline Agile Toolkit. And one of the challenges that we see in many organizations is they start looking at the complexity that they face. So in Discipline Agile, we basically hold up a mirror to your organizational complexity and we say, hey, here's what you're looking at. Here's, here's the stuff that you're dealing with. Um, and you, need to, you need, to, need to deal with it. And a very common reaction is, well, OK, fine. Yes, you know, we, we, we have finance. We have data management. We have enterprise architecture and all these, all these other things. And they're all important. So let's tell the finance people, just, you know, go off and figure out how you're going to do finance. And go off and figure out how you're going to do data management and so on. Um, which is great, but if they go in different directions, if they start locally optimizing, so if the finance people come up with their finance strategy and it doesn't fit in with what everybody else is doing, then they still, you know, it, it doesn't work out. And we see this in organizations today. Like we often, you know, we often complain about the procurement processes in organizations, or we often complain about how finance is, is, har is you know, doing great harm to the Agile teams you know, by forcing them to do these big estimates up front and, and stuff like that. And so these ideas that make sense to finance 
um, are actually quite harmful in many ways to the rest of the organization. The, uh, the strategies that make sense to procurement in isolation make, that make sense to them are actually quite harmful to the rest of the organization. So we need to look at the bigger picture. We need to be enterprise aware. We need to understand we're all working together and we, you know, that we're really part of an overall fleet and we've got to move together. Um, so we need to look at this bigger picture. So just trying to divide and conquer will not get the job done. And we see this over and over and over again in the organizations because they are dealing with complexity. And so the one way to deal with complexity is to you know, break it up into smaller, smaller chunks. Um, in this case, that doesn't work out so well. We need to, you know, we need to you know, all move together and, and evolve and improve and learn together um, in parallel. Um, hoping the problem will solve itself, hoping that you know, whatever challenges your organization currently faces will go away all on their own. Um, good luck with that strategy in this hyper-competitive marketplace that we're in. Um, I think you know, this isn't, isn't going to work out so well, um, and it doesn't. Uh, we, we've run into several companies that have pretty much committed suicide um, because they left, the, you know, they left solving their, addressing their challenges a, a bit too late. And now they're, you know, they're still sort of alive, but it's not looking uh, hopeful for them in, in some ways. Um, and this is, is related as well. I'm waiting until there's an obvious crisis, crisis. So there's a really good change method called Cotter, the Cotter method, if you're familiar with it. And it's like this eight-step process. And step number one, and, and it's a wonderful, it, you know, in, in, in some situations, it, it actually is quite good. And, but step number one it basically boils down to you need to have like a 75 or 80% consensus amongst the senior leadership in your organization that you face a crisis. And until you achieve that, it, you know, you're probably going to struggle to you know, go through the rest of the steps. So you have to have this you know, common understanding that you're in crisis. But unfortunately, the marketplace moves so fast now that by the time you realize that you come to this agreement amongst your leadership that we're in trouble, it's probably too late because now you don't have enough time to react. Right? So you've got to be constantly monitoring, constantly, uh, you know, constantly evolving, constantly changing. So this is a bit of a challenge. Also, also a common theme from the keynote is that you know, senior leadership um, knows best. Um, and it's simply not the case. The people doing the work uh, are the ones that typically know better. And you know, part of the, the, the theme from the keynote this morning is not to, have, not to have bosses at all, not to have these senior leaders, that everybody is a leader, that everybody should be making important decisions within the scope of the responsibility and, uh, and accountability and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, of course, um, believing you can transform quickly. Um, this is culture change. This is behavior change. This is skilling change. This takes time. This takes many years. This is a, a multi-year journey. And, and yesterday, if you attended my talk, I, I, I talked about how if you read the DevOps case studies about how these organizations, like the Amazons of the world and the Ebays of the world and the Spotify's and all this sort of stuff, have achieved these awesome results. And they're, they're doing things that are, are often in, almost impossible for your organization to even imagine doing. And they're doing it on a regular basis as if it's almost basically nothing. And they didn't get to this point just by snapping their fingers and running a transformation project. And a few months later, they were awesome. All the stories are the same. It's been a multi-year journey, 10, 15 years sometimes, of a series of small improvements of you know, run an experiment, see what happens, and improve. So um, this is a very common um, thing that we're seeing in these organizations. And all, the case, all, all these DevOps case studies are all the same in that, in that respect. Um, so there, if you're looking for an easy, so I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you're looking for an easy recipe, an easy way to do this transformation, there isn't one. And you'll more than likely cause yourself significantly harm by, by significant harm by um, trying to do an easy, quick approach. Um, you'll probably make the situation worse than what you currently face by going for the easy route. Um, Assuming there, uh, another challenge is assuming everybody wants to change. You know, when, you've got, when your organization is hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people, everybody's got different visions. They've got different priorities. They've got, you know, some people are very happy working in whatever way they're currently working now. Um, they don't see the crisis, or maybe they see the crisis and don't really care, or it doesn't affect them, they believe. Um, so they don't want to change. So not everybody's going to want to make this improvement journey, and yet you still need to help them. Uh, a, a, an interesting challenge that I'm seeing amongst some of the transformation coaches these days is this idea that, well, if, if this group over here is really hard to work with or doesn't want to go, why well, the heck with them? 
you know, we won't do the hard stuff. We'll just, we'll just, do, you know, we'll just pick the low-hanging fruit. We'll work the easy groups that want to change, but you know, this group over here, the finance group or the data management group or you know, whatever group of people that is, because they're, because they're pushing back and they, and they want to be difficult, we're not going to help them at all. Well, that's you know, basically ignoring a serious problem, and that, that will not solve itself. That's going to be a, you know, a reasonably bad thing for you. So um, we need to look at the, you know, we need to help everybody um, and understand that not everybody might not want that help, and there's different ways we can, you know, different ways we're going to uh, do that. And we also see organizations, and this is part of the looking for the easy answer thing. We see, we see organizations adopting a method or adopting a framework, not because it makes sense for them, but because other organizations are doing it over and over and over again. We see companies basically say, hey, you know, what, you know, what are the people down the street doing? Therefore, I'm, I should do it too. This is the level of thinking that we get. Okay, and that, you know, just because other people are doing it at first, did it make sense for them? Maybe, maybe not, you don't know. But even if it did make sense for them, it doesn't mean it's going to make sense for you. Right, because you're, you're a unique person in a unique organization. You know, you, your organization is unique, your teams are unique. You need to do the right thing for you, not just copy what everybody else is doing. And if you copy what your competitors are doing, you're an also ran. You're not competitive, you're not innovative if you're doing the same thing your competitors are doing. And you're guaranteed to fail in the new, in the new world. Um, so we've got to be a little bit smarter about this. And then finally, um, we need to realize that there is no plan. That yes, you want to do planning and do a little bit of upfront thinking and get going in the right direction. But we need to recognize that this is, a, you know, this is like you know, driving in Bangalore. You're going to be going all over the place. <laughs> you know, there's not you know, a straight line way to get anywhere um, in this city. And it's the same sort of thing when you're planning a transformation. So, um, just imagine that you're, you're driving home tonight, and that's, the, that's basically what your plan is going to end up looking like. Um, so anyways, Mark, if you want to take it over. Thanks, Scott. Can you hear me? OK, in the back? Yeah? OK. Um, so that's the bad, and I'm going to talk about the good. So first of all, I'm Mark from Calgary, and I, I just want to say this is a real treat for Scott and I. We actually don't have many opportunities to speak together. Uh, he lives in eastern Canada in Toronto. I'm in western Canada in Calgary. It's a four-hour flight, and we independently travel all over the world. So this is uh, good fun for us to actually be on the stage together. So I'm going to talk about the good. Um, I should also say that yesterday, um, Scott did a talk on choosing your wow, choosing your way of working, which is based on our latest book. just came out. We're really proud of it. It replaces our first book from 2012. And it's about building those high-performance engines. It's a toolkit full of strategies that you can use to supplement whatever technique you're currently using, whether you're using Scrum, Lean, XP, Safe, Less. Regardless of method or framework that you're using, those methods are not comprehensive. And you're going to have to figure stuff out yourself. And you can fail fast on your journey to learning, or you can pick strategies from the toolkit that are based on certain contexts. You can find one that matches your context. That's going to improve your ch chances of success. You'll make better decisions, you'll have better outcomes, and you'll be more successful much quicker. Um, so that, that was yesterday's talk, Building High Performance Teams. Today, we're talking about our third book, which is the Executive Guide. And it's about optimizing, not at the local level, not optimizing teams, which, which is this. this. This is the delivery aspect, but optimizing the organization itself. That, that is, if, if you just concentrate on building those high performance teams and ignore these other areas, you will fail, right? Because finance and security and release management and data management and enterprise architecture and PMOs, they have their own ways of working, right? And by the way, those are smart people. They're doing things that what they think is the best way to protect their interests in the interest of the organization. But the problem is that there's a mismatch between traditional PMOs, traditional enterprise architecture authorities, and the way your agile teams are working. So what you need to do is get out there and educate them on the new ways of working. They're smart people. They're good people. They just haven't been told what the options are. So this is what, our, when we started with that, it was about the delivery team level. And over the last oh, seven years, we've, we've gone up scale throughout the entire organization to help you get better at all these different areas. So I encourage you to look into the toolkit, whether it's governance, PMOs, release management, DevOps, lots of great ideas inside the toolkit. So what, what I'm talking about here now is uh, this comes from chapter seven of our, our executive guide. And what we're doing here is we're actually kind of sharing our crown jewels. We're sharing with you how we do transformations at companies. Now there's a difference between a transformation and an adoption, right? 
A lot of mistake, uh, mistakes people make is they take a large scale agile framework and plop it down on an existing organization without uh, doing the hard things, without doing the necessity, ne necessary transformation. And if you just do an adoption with a large scale agile framework, you th it may seem like it's working, but it's gonna fall apart over time. So what I'm talking about th is the need to actually do a true transformation. And what you see here is the top, this is our roadmap, it's in the book. And the, the top part of it talks about enterprise coaching. So when you hear about it, coaching, there's team level coaching, but there's also enterprise coaching. And so it, you, we have different types of coaches, right? So the, at the higher level is the enterprise coaching where uh, it's a long-term thing and you do things, I'm gonna talk, I won't talk through all these bubbles, uh, you can read about it later, but we also have team coaching. I'm gonna step you through some of the things on this diagram, but we don't have time to talk about them all. Um, so th the subject of this talk is essentially how to do the transformation. Now, um, this picture is also in the book and it talks about your effort, it's a multi-year effort, and the effort that you put into your transformation activities will vary depending on where you are in your transformation and who you're working with. So I, I won't go through the details of here, through this because this could be an hour presentation just by itself. But you can see here it includes things like executive education. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, your agile training of the team's management. What about the folks in the middle? Um, they need to be agile as well. And by the way, that's, that's a, a lesson from the trenches that if you don't spend time with your agile managers, you're probably going to run into problems because they're going to be scared is there a place for me in, my, in the new organization? And the, yes, there is, is the good news, but they need to, you need to educate them on what their new role is. Yeah. And, and if you don't engage with them, they will actively undermine you. They will. Because they are under threat, and the only response is to fight back. They can either flee or fight, and they almost always fight, yeah. and they're pretty good at winning. Yeah, and, and we're not perfect. We, you know, we, this is a journey for us as well, and this is a lesson we learned, is that am I personally, uh, in, in the past have ignored the middle layer too long. Uh, but now, of course, we don't do that. In fact, if I go back to the previous one, there is a place that talks about, um, you know, educating your middle management. Really, really important. Okay. Uh, it's also important in your transformation that you understand who your agile champions and sponsors are. And we recommend that you have a product owner a, that helps you prioritize, just like on a scrum team, helps you prioritize where you're going to do your transformation, where you're going to focus your efforts. Now, one of the things that Scott, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a second, but Scott talked about Cotter and his structured change management methods, and they're really, really good. But the problem is if you use Cotter, ADCAR, whatever it is, often they used to be, and sometimes still are, rolled out in a waterfall fashion. So it's like this month we're going to deal with that PMO, and next month it will be architecture, and then next month it will be release management, that is not the way to go, okay? So what you want to do is pick the low-hanging fruit from each of those areas and work on them little pieces simultaneously. But you need a product owner to help you understand where you should be spending your time. So understand you need to have that on, on your teams. We typically get started by doing a very short assessment. We're not big fans of going in and doing a two-month assessment, charging $200,000 and all that. We actually find that we can get a good idea of what the challenges are that an organization faces in three to five days. And um, yes, maybe we're missing a big sales opportunity, but that's not the point, right? We want to get in and, and get busy as quickly as we can. An executive workshop, extremely important that you get your executives on board before trying this transformation. If you don't, you're not going to succeed. And it's the same idea where the uh, um, authorities like enterprise architecture and release management PMOs are good people, but they just don't understand the new ways of working. You can say the same thing about executives. I mean, they got to be executives not because they're dummies. They're smart people. But often they don't understand the new ways of working. So what we do is we have some workshops with the executives to help educate them you know, that the project-based mentality of the past is, is, is kind of from the past, and we want to move much more towards a product or release cycle. The annual planning and funding dance that we go through can, should, can and should be replaced by more of a rolling wave approach, a much more agile approach. Um, some of the traditional HR approaches really need to be modernized. And again, they're smart people. So what, what we do is educate them on the new ways of working, right? And also, Let's understand what is our vision for this transformation. What are we trying to accomplish and why are we doing it? And this is an example of a change canvas. You may have seen canvases before. It's essentially putting the vision for your transformation onto one page 
And you see here in the middle, I'm going to be referring to the bit in the middle in a second. These are, this is the key vision for a particular company, the kinds of things they want to do. Uh, improve IT delivery dependability, improve response time to customer needs, improve quality, develop high performance teams. And then other aspects of it. What are our success criteria? How are we going to communicate out to our stakeholders? What is the level of urgency? What is the end state that we expect to achieve? Get this, do this in a workshop with your executives, then print it out on a plotter and put it in a public area so everybody can see. Really important. We expect transparency on individual teams. Why wouldn't this be any different? We want radical transparency in the transformation as well. Now this is the exercise that is probably one of the most important exercises in your transformation. It's educating your executives that the things on the left are not as good as the things on the right. And for ev every organization, this list will be slightly different. So please don't use this. This is a workshop and this is what comes out of the workshop. An agreement from your executive that dispersed teams are, it's much better to have co-located teams. Um, replace the project mentality with the release mentality. Large projects with small. I won't re read the list, but you can see part-time allocation of resources to dedicated team members. In the past, it used to be considered a quote-unquote best practices to have Johnny on 100% utilized. So he was 30% on this project and 50% on this project, and somebody with some tool or spreadsheet says, Johnny's not busy 20% of the time. We need to find a third project for Johnny, right? And if so, hopefully some of you understand how ridiculous that is because of the cost of contact switching. But we used to think that was a best practice, right? So it, we have to educate the executives there's a better way to go. Really important. When you get, and, and now this becomes a beacon for the transformation. We, we print this off, we put it in a public area. Now when somebody says, hey, Mark, we're going to start this $10 million initiative, I want all the executives in the room to hold, hold each other accountable and say, I thought we said we weren't going to do that anymore. We said we were going to go from principle number three, from large projects to small projects, because large projects typically fail. And they go, oh yeah, we did say that, didn't we? Let's break that $10 million thing down into $1 million projects and then see how that goes, right? So this becomes extremely important to sort of grease the skids for your transformation. Now in terms of the change management technique itself, now rubber hits the road and we're going to start to help organizations. We like to use a lean change approach. We didn't come up with this. It's come up, with a, come up by another Canadian, Jason Little and Jeff Anderson. Jeff Anderson. You know, yeah. it's a, it, there's a number of people behind this change management method. But it's a marrying of structured approaches with an agile lean approach. So we're using agile to implement agile. Why would we do it any, any other way, right? So it's a, I encourage you to, to, to read Jason's book. It's, it's quite interesting. He talks about insights, options, and minimal viable changes, or MVCs. Insights are pain points. As an example, the team says, oh, you know what? We have to do these detailed business cases. The PMO demands it before they let us proceed. It's a 50-page template. It's going to take a month. Why wish we didn't have to do that? Oh, that's an insight. That's, that's, I always say, are those groups, PMOs and enterprise architects and release management, if you ask your teams, would they consider them to be enablers of your agility or impediments? What do you think, right? I'm telling you they should be enablers, and yeah. this is their new mindset that we need to teach them. So anyway, an insight. Business cases, they're too waterfallish, too, too bureaucratic. So what we do is what is an option? Well, it might be several, but one of them might be, let's come up with a one-page business case, a lightweight one-page A4 business case. So what you do is you don't go into the PMO and say, I'm here to introduce Agile. We're not doing that anymore. We're going to do this. No, that's not what you do. You negotiate with them to say, we have a hypothesis. We believe that replacing that 50-page business case with a one-page is going to save us a lot of time and money, and we actually won't miss that 50-pager. And you know what? If it, let's try that for three or four projects, and if that, that doesn't work, we can go back to the way we used to do it. That's really important. If they know, you've set in the hypothesis, an experiment, if it doesn't work out, if they know they can go back to what they're comfortable with, they're more likely to give it a try. So that's very important, negotiating the change. You can't shove it down, as Scott said, you can't shove it down their throat. So you prepare for the change, you introduce it, you measure it for a while. If it's good, you keep doing it. Maybe you learn that maybe there's another option you should try. So experiment with that. Or maybe you roll it back and you say, you know what, that wasn't a good idea. Let's go back to what you were doing before. This is the change management process. So a minimal viable change, a very tiny change 
that maximizes the value while minimizing the disruption. Okay? Yeah. And you can and should be doing several of these at once. This sure. is not a serial one at a time type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for that, Scott. So what we do is we take each of those changes and we put them on a Kanban board. Just, and everybody can see it. No secrets. Just like everybody else, you can see the stuff that we are, the MVCs that are in progress, the ones that are, have been done now, we're reviewing them to see whether or not they're working, and ones that we've, yeah, they're done. It's now been institutionalized. Now let's pull another change in. It's classic lean Kanban. You don't have too much whip, right? Too much work in progress. But this, this is how you, you roll out your MVCs. Thanks, Scott. Now, metrics. Okay, metrics is an important part of a transformation. And I, I can't remember who I heard saying this. It might have been Scott yesterday, but absolutely, you want the time to start introducing metrics is not halfway through your transformation. It's day one. It's when things are bad. Don't start metrics when things are already good. And now this can be demoralizing to the teams when we show them, gee, we're failing our sprints every time, and we're capturing that as a metrics. But I always say, you know what? That's okay, because we're learning. And you're going to feel really good when those reds start to turn to greens. So start metrics when things are bad, don't wait. That's a, a key lesson learned uh, that I've learned over the years as well. Now, what we, we also, I mean, we, we have um, a lot of webinars on Discipline Agile for the consortium, uh, and uh, we've done webinars on metrics on this lean change method. And when we talk about metrics, you don't want to Google top 10 Agile metrics and roll them out. <laughs> you want to do metrics design. You want to roll out very few metrics. And we actually talk about this in our lean governance course as well. It's a one-day course. You want to roll out very few metrics and targeted metrics to measure the progress against the pain in the organization. Every organization is going to have different pains. Throughput, value from IT spend, uh, quality, attrition, morale. Every organization is different. So if quality is the problem, perceived problem, then roll out a metric initially to measure improvement in quality. So what you see here is we use a technique called goal question metric. This is just one of the strategies. There are different strategies for metrics. Um, OKRs is another one, objectives, key results. We actually like G, uh, G, uh, GQM better, but we're all about choice. But it, we like it, it works for us. So what you see here is a goal might be to improve delivery dependability. That's a goal. Well, what questions can we ask that help us understand whether or not we're improving our IT deliverability? <laughs> Question might be, are teams dedicated to actually meeting their commitments? Or are they kind of not focused, right? Okay, that's a good question. How do we measure that? Well, we could say the percentage of planned versus delivered work that was actually delivered. Or percentage of time that the team has to dedicate to pulling work off their own backlog. Maybe they're distracted by management activities or another project. So this, you can actually measure, measure this. So there's examples of metrics, okay? Now, what you see here is that, remember the change canvas I showed you? And in the middle, there was a, a vision with the key, key things that they wanted to achieve. Well, these metrics map to those. So we can tell whether or not we're actually succeeding in our transformation. People often ask us, how do I measure success? This is how you measure. So you see here, improve IT delivery dependability is actually the very first transformation goal. So measure against your transformation effort. Um, this is a, a real example from a client where they've actually put all this stuff together on one whiteboard, very <laughs> agile and, and lean and small. But you can see here a mixture of a number of things. I took a picture of this because I, I thought, well, this is kind of neat. A lot, of, a lot of stuff going on here. Bottom left, what you can see, see is that they were redesigning the workspaces for the team. Uh, in the middle is a strategy board to talk about their key objectives and key categories. In, next to it, the first metrics that they're rolling out. And then the moving away, moving from, is the, uh, the I showed you an example of that in a previous slide. For this company, I remember there was, I was, I was this is in the, the coach's room, the internal product owner I told you about, and I was in there having a meeting with him, and there was a board of directors meeting that day, and they were doing a walk around of the floor. It's a software product company. The board is walking around the floor, and they walk into our office, and they say, what's going on here? We, we tell them what we're doing, and, and I remember the board member going up, and he looked at these, and he was asking us questions about our progress against each of these objectives. It's not, you know, it's not really hard to understand, right? But there's a good example of information radiators, transparency, being held accountable for what you're doing. Okay, I'm just about done. I'm going to pass it over to Scott in a second. This is a journey. It's not a destination. Um, transformations, the hard stuff, lasts typically a few years, but then it morphs into a continuous improvement journey, which goes on and on and on. So you do the hard transformation stuff, but understand 
that it's going, continuous improvement is going to continue. Now, inside Discipline Agile, how do you organize all this guidance? We organize it into things called goal diagrams or process blades. And here you're looking at the continuous improvement process blade. And the, the rectangles are things that you need to think about that help you with your continuous improvement. And a couple I want to talk about right now are COPs and COEs. And we don't have time to talk about all the details. I want to highlight some, some things here. People get mixed up between the difference of a COE and a COP. A center of excellence is like your transformation team. They're there typically for a shorter period of time, full-time staffed with people as part of an initiative to do your transformation. Hopefully you get some coaching involved to help you out with your COE. A COP, on the other hand, is more of a longer-term construct, construct what, what Spotify calls guilds. I happen to like that term. I think it sounds like a medieval guild where it's all about the craft. And um, staffed by pra practitioners, and they learn from each other sort of longer term. So there's a, a difference between COEs and COPs. This is an actual picture of one of our clients, and I took a picture of it because I thought it was kind of cool that in a certain area of the floor, they actually had these labels, there's a typo here, so say disciplined agile and continuous improvement. So they put the COE and the COPs together into one group. And then another group is about the DevOps, integration, CI, CD, and, and how DA can help you with that. So really nice to see this visual recognition of these groups in, in our customers. So I'm um, going to uh, do, do this slide, and I'll toss it back to Scott. Invest in coaching. Think, you know, coaching are accelerators on your journey. Right? They can get you from A to B much quicker than trying to figure it out yourself. Trying to figure it out yourself is a time-consuming and very costly prospect. Okay, so this, the coaching can really accelerate your journey. You're going to have different kinds of coaches, technical coaches, um, you know, scrum kind of coaches, team coaches, enterprise coaches, and make sure that they're coaching not just the teams but the other areas in your organization. And uh, with that, I think I'll toss it back to Scott. Yeah, yeah thank you. So one of the, one of the themes that, that is a tad dysfunctional, in my opinion, in the Agile community is that it's all about mindset. And certainly mindset is important. Like, you know, don't get me wrong. But if you don't know how to do things, you're still sort of useless. And um, this, I think, we need the skills. And I think you know, some, of the, some of the speakers that Dave Farley was getting at that yesterday, we need the technical skills to do the job as well. We need to know what we're doing. So it's not just about mindset. It's not, you know, mindset's absolutely critical. Um, but we also need the skill set as well. So um, don't, uh, don't buy into some of the easy, you know, touchy-feely fixes stuff. It's, it's all critical. but. It's not the full picture. So I, I, uh, we're, we're firm believers in looking at the full picture. Um, you know, for those of you who attended yesterday's talk, we, we saw this. And when you adopt these prescriptive methods, these, these prescriptive frameworks, uh, there is value. Like, you know, it's, we saw some industry stats, 7 to 12%, good stuff like that. Um, there's value there, you know, without a doubt. Like, that's, that's, a, that's a good improvement. So think, you know, when you're successful at adopting these methods, things get better. But you know, like I was saying earlier, with the um, you know, with all these DevOps case studies, they're all, this, they're all basically the same. The, the message is the same, that we want to take this experimental approach. We want to you know, try new ideas, see if they work for us. Um, because every team is different, everybody, every person is different, every team is different, every organization is different. So just because a strategy or practice works well for somebody else, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. You need to try it out, see what works for you, adopt the good stuff, Abandon the bad stuff. You know, measure, and Mark was getting at this uh, earlier with the, the lean change management stuff. Um, so uh, so, basi so the, the basic message here is we want to be constantly iterating. We want to be constantly experimenting and adopting, adopting new ways of working to see what works for us. And the Discipline Agile Toolkit provides some guidance. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. We could have the humility to recognize that other people, other teams, have, are, have dealt with the same challenges that we currently face. So we could leverage their learnings. We could leverage these other, these other strategies that are you know, proven in practice. And you know, like Mark was saying earlier, we could, you know, by using the toolkit, we can actually identify likely, you know, likely strategies that are, will work for us in the context that we face. Because we have options. There are no such things as best practices. There's always multiple ways to do things. So let's choose, so let's, uh, my philosophy, or our, our philosophy is, do the best you can in the situation that you face and always try to get better, right? So this is, this is what we're aiming at. Um, so what we can do is, with a little bit of lightweight guidance, we can achieve better results over time. So 
instead of trying to reinvent the wheel like we see in the da like figuring it out on your own in the dash line, which works well, but it's a little bit slower and expensive, we can speed things up by making better decisions at the very beginning and you know, running experiments that are more likely to succeed. Right? So we can, you know, we can succeed instead of just failing fast, which is a good strategy, we can succeed earlier, which is what we're getting at. So a little, little, little uh, uh, more positive spin on the fail fast stuff. Um, and we can do this. You know, so if you are in method prison right now, like Ivar Jakobsen likes to say, if you are you know, following a process, it's, you know, you've either chosen to, to you know, adopt a method or adopt a framework or it's been forced upon you, OK, fine, that is what it is. Um, but we can work our way out of method prison and get on this true improvement path that we've been talking about, exactly like we've been hearing from all these DevOps organizations. OK, so we can get out of jail free, uh, or get out of jail with a little bit of work, I should say. So anyway, so I'll hand it off to Mark again yep. for a little and few thoughts. We're just about out of time, so I'll keep it quick here. These are real life examples from some of our clients. Simplify your process, get your stuff out of Microsoft Project, get in on, on walls. Now, I know you all know that. I know that's obvious in the Agile world. But this is an example of an MVC, right? You go in and say, hey, let's stop doing the Microsoft Project stuff. Let's get stuff. I know it's Agile basics, but all the stuff needs to be prioritized. Some of it's enterprise. Some of it's team stuff. So there's an example of an MVC. Another one is um, simplify the process. Get away from long upfront planning. Replace it with Agile, what we call inception. You might think of it as Sprint Zero. We take a little bit more rigorous approach to Sprint Zero, by the way. Um, and we call it inception. So th this is an, a real life example of an inception workshop with some story mapping going on, visualizing the arc or exploring the architecture on the left hand side. And then uh, another um, MVC might be we need to change workspaces. Let's design new workspaces. True story here started with uh, drawings, went to a furniture company, prototyped the work area. On the bottom right, you see uh, the whole, they've redesigned the entire space. And by the way, the manager's offices have been moved into the middle of the floor so that the developers can get the windows. And um, yeah, so just wrapping up here. Okay. Yeah, and, so, and another common theme at the conference is we really need leaders, not just managers. So you know, today's managers, I would hope, or, or everybody, I hope, would uh, move into a, you know, become more uh, leadership focused. So, and we should inspire the change. We should be the change that we want to be. So some of the, ide some of the critical ideas you've heard um, here, you know, have a product order, this champion for your transformation, and also have a secession plan for your champion. Because this is a multi-year journey. You can't count on the champion and the product owner to be around all that time. You know, they leave, they move on to other things. So make sure that they're grooming somebody else to take over and, re and uh, to fill in if they, if they decide to move on. Um, be Constant communication, absolutely critical. Have these visible walls, these visible work boards. Um, be constantly saying, here's what we're trying to achieve, here's what we're doing, here's what's working well, here's what's not working well. Have this constant drumbeat. And I, I find that annoying, actually, having to do it, but you've got to continue to say, here's what we're doing, here's where we are, and just have this regular drumbeat, of this, and it's almost always the same message. Um, so you want to repeat yourself constantly on this. Um, definitely get some, some good coaching. We're obviously biased because we, you know, we do coaching, but um, you need coaches, you need people to help you, uh, at both at the team level, at the enterprise level, at the specialized level as well. So doing, you know, coaching the finance or the, the procurement people is a different thing than coaching software development people. Coaching the data management folks is definitely a different thing too. So, you, and you've got to have a background in this sort of thing. You've got to have a background in what you're coaching. Because uh, if, you if you don't know how to do what you're coaching in, your advice is going to be questionable at best. So, I mean, this I think is a, a challenge the Agile community faces right now. Um, around the quality of our coaches and the, you know, not having the background. It was interesting yesterday, the, the, you know, the, the presentation started off with how many people here are coaches, well, many people raised their hand, and then, um, then the next question was how many people are experts in Agile, and only three or four people raised their hand. I'll just leave it at that, right? So, um, you know, it's, there's this question there. So anyway, so I, I, time for a minute or so for questions, maybe one or two questions? One or two. Probably one question. Two minutes. Okay, question. Good question. We um, how do we for the for the, the the recording? How do we measure the readiness of the client for a transformation? So that's why why we start with an assessment, right? We're going to go out yeah. and talk talk to key uh, stakeholders at all levels: team level, middle management business, executives, and help them understand if they have the right mindset to, to, um, 
to address the change. You know, um, Scott, one of the anti-patterns is waiting until there's a crisis to do the transformation. But I can tell you that often that's what starts the transformation, yeah. is we get the call to say, Mark, help us. Uh, we're not competitive anymore. And, and then we start, and, it, and we're willing to walk away from a transformation if they're not willing to do some of the harder things, for sure. Yeah. As a framework? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it in our executive guide. You can find it on Amazon. Yeah. And, and standard is probably the wrong word. Like, you know, so for example, the we've got several flavors of doing the assessments, like a workshop-y type of thing versus an interview type of thing, because you've got to judge the, the, cult the existing culture of the organization will sort of guide the decisions in what type of assessment will work well for, work well for them. So, um, and as well, what, what are they willing to actually work towards? But. Yeah, so um, we are here for the, the week, so don't be shy about coming up to us. Look for the blue shirt or the white shirt, the white shirt with Discipline Agile on it. Be happy to answer any questions that you have over a key. I'll be blue for every other day other than today. So. <laughs> All right. One more question, maybe, quickly. Everybody have to become agile. It is not only the delivery teams. So when when a um, new management approaches to you, so that happens in the stage level, or everything is addressed at one point, and uh, you know it might take few years. I understand, but how do you plan for it as a coach? I mean, how do you suggest them? It so, some of it catches catch can, but you've got to realize that if you know if we're helping a team here and they interact with five other teams to get the job done, then. Part of the strategy has got to be these five other teams have to at least become agile enough to allow this team here to succeed at becoming agile, um, and, or they have to be willing to get out of the way. Um, so you know, it's, it's yeah. that sort of logic. So you, you've got to you got to sort of you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time. And my key point would be yes, if you, exactly. <laughs> it's a big elephant, and and you need to understand which are the highest pain points and, and get you know low hanging fruit. Go after the biggest pains in the organization and take a lean approach. Don't take a waterfall, try to design the entire transformation up front. Won't work. Find the pains and just deal with them and pull your ability to do change as you have the capacity to do so. And you will find after a couple of years, the organization is a completely different organization than it was before you started. It's one of the reasons that we're so passionate about what we do is by the time we leave, everybody's happier. I mean, there's a gentleman over here that worked with me in, in, in the United States at a large pizza company. And one of the things I helped them do was get rid of timesheets and time tracking. Anybody here love time tracking? Okay. No. No more. They don't need to do them anymore. Increasing the joy of fin both finance and the teams. That's just one simple example. So um, okay. it can be a lot of fun. So thank you very much. We will yep. be around. We're easy to find um, online if you can't find us when we're here. Awesome. Thank you.